Hi, welcome to Stat Stuff. I'm Matt Hansen. This lesson is part of an extended series on the hypothesis testing in the analyze phase. In particular, I'll review in this lesson the six basic sub-process steps used when doing a hypothesis test. Please be sure you've at least reviewed the prior lesson on hypothesis testing that lays a critical foundation on this concept. But for now, let's review again the four basic steps for doing hypothesis testing. Well, there's four basic steps at a high level again. We're taking things from practical to statistical and then back to practical again. It was starting off with defining the practical problem up front as a simple yes or no question. And then converting that problem to an analytical question where we're trying to identify the statistical tool or method that we're going to use to help solve the problem. Then we're going to apply that statistical tool or method and then interpret the results from that using the hypothesis test and method in order to come to some statistical solution. Once we've got the statistical solution, then we can and interpret the results of that using the information that we have about the project and come up with some practical way where we can come up with a practical interpretation of the information from the analysis. And again, it's in the steps two and three where it's the heart of hypothesis testing. We're going to spend most of our time in digging in further to the additional steps necessary for hypothesis testing. Okay, now let's talk about the two basic ways you can go about doing the second and third step of those four basic steps by defining a statistical problem and deriving a statistical solution. Well, how do we define a statistical problem? Well, there are two ways that we can do that for hypothesis testing. We can use a formal method or an informal method. The formal method is referring to a stringent process that we would use where you might find yourself in high-risk situations or using highly precision instruments, or especially if you're just starting out with the first time and doing this, it's a great method to follow so you can get used to the different steps. But there also could be an informal method where it's less stringent and it's used in general business operations, so it may not be as strict compared to the formal method. So what we're going to do is we're going to review the formal method to be familiar with those concepts and most of the training that we have is going to generally follow some of that but we're also going to introduce the informal method as part of this as well. So the formal hypothesis testing generally follows six sub-steps we're going to look at. Again, if we look at our model where we started off with looking at a high level where we're taking things from a practical problem, converting it to a statistical problem, then translating that to a statistical solution that we interpret into a practical solution, we're going to follow this here where the first step we want to follow in hypothesis testing is defining the objective. Then we want to state the null hypothesis, which is H sub zero, and alternative hypothesis, which is H sub A. And then we want to define the confidence, which is 1 minus alpha risk, and the power level, which is 1 minus the beta risk. And then the fourth step is we want to collect the sample data and calculate then finally the p-value. All these make up the steps that we would follow when we want to get into this section here, number two, which is defining the statistical problem. And then once we've done that, we can move on to this last step, which is interpreting the results. And this is where we decide whether we're going to accept or reject the null hypothesis, which is the H sub zero. And that's a part of what we would get into in this third step of the statistical solution. Now from an informal perspective, it's going to kind of accelerate, it's going to follow the same steps, but we're going to accelerate a little bit where you don't have to be necessarily as stringent in following all six steps. So it might look something like this. And this is where we're going to take the um, objective and we're going to combine that with the practical problem. We may not have to have it separately formalized. And we also don't necessarily have to follow step two in here of of defining the formally defining the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis as well as um, may not have to formally define the confidence and power uh, we might just automatically use a default level for the for the alpha risk and that might be sufficient but re regardless we're going to be collecting the sample data and calculating the p-value but we also as a sixth step might combine the results with the practical solution now we're not trying to dilute it in any way, dilute the whole methodology and ignore any potential risks by skipping some of these steps in the process. But what we want to try to do is accelerate it. It may not require a formal documentation like some folks go through, especially if you need to follow a stringent process, then it's good to walk through the actual more formal method. But sometimes when we're going through basic analysis, we can skip a few of these. We may skip some of the formality. I like to think of it in terms of, for anyone who might have uh, first learned how to drive a car. The first time in driving it, you might have been extra cautious and aware of, of where your mirrors were and where your all the different buttons and dials and controls and being hypersensitive about how you're driving, which is really good and there's nothing wrong with that. But usually folks who have done it for a while and become more relaxed and they're less stringent in observing all those different dials and controls and they're not as hypersensitive as they might have been the first time they were learning how to drive. 
Well, it's really similar in this case. As you get more confident in following the steps and familiarity with the steps, you might find yourself being able to skip some of the formality, not do as much documentation through it because you can quickly jump to some of the uh, solutions and conclusions that you need to get to. Uh, again, you don't want to compromise or introduce any additional risk along the way by doing that, uh, but you can relax some of it as long as depending on the situation, your organization, and your method and what you're, what you're analyzing, sometimes that might be appropriate to do that. So if you find yourself in that situation, it can be okay, again, as long as you're not introducing additional risk by doing that. Now let's dig into those six sub-process steps by diving into that first step on defining the objective. Well, the first step in defining the objective, what we want to start off is wondering what is the question that we're trying to answer. We need to make sure that we state that objective as a yes or no question. And when we do that, we need to emphasize the difference between values. As an example, is there a difference between metric A and metric B? And we also want to include any more specific details such as referencing the data elements that we're actually going to be using in the analysis. So if we started off in the very beginning as an example of a practical problem, does it cost more to use a vendor to run our call center? Well, that might be appropriate as a practical problem, but we need, need, we need to, again, convert that or translate that to a statistical problem. So the translation of that where we're defining the objective could be, is there a difference in cost between a vended and internally operated call center? So here, this is where we're emphasizing the difference between them, and we're including the specific information of what we're going to be analyzing, which is between a vended and internally operated call center. So just by noting the difference here, and that we're going to be using cost cost as a measurement and the two factors we're going to look at is whether it's vended or internally operated. This gives us enough elements to understand what it is that we need to analyze. Then we move on to the second step which is stating the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis again presumes innocence, that is that there's no difference between the factors. The goal in our doing our hypothesis testing is to test that null hypothesis to really see if it's true. If the null hypothesis is true, that is where the H sub zero is accepted, then that's saying the analyzed factor is innocent. That is, there is no difference between the factors we're comparing. However, if it's false, then we're saying that the null hypothesis is rejected. That is, the analyzed factor is presumed to be guilty. There is a difference between the factors that we're analyzing. So it's in this latter case, though, where the alternative hypothesis is what's accepted. That is the H sub A and that's when the null hypothesis is rejected. So when we say we accept the alternative hypothesis, that's almost the same, it's really the same thing as saying we're rejecting the null hypothesis. Usually in a formal sense for hypothesis testing, we usually only speak in terms of the null hypothesis. We either say it's accepted or rejected. We usually do not use the terms of accepting the alternative hypothesis. It's okay to say that, it's essentially the same thing, but it's good to at least be familiar with the formal way it's, it's usually used. So as an example, we might ask ourselves again, is there a difference in cost between a vended and internally operated call center? Well then, we might define the null hypothesis as the mean for the vendor is equal to the mean for the internal. That is, there's no difference between the mean cost. From an alternative hypothesis perspective, we might define that as the mean cost for the vendor is not equal to the mean cost for the internal locations. That is, there is a difference between the mean cost. Now the way we might illustrate that from a distribution standpoint might look something like this. We're on the scale, we have a distribution representing the mean cost for the vended site, and we might have a distribution for the mean cost for the internal site. And what we need to figure out is, is there a difference between these means? Is that statistically different or not? And that could be some of the things that we're testing. If they are the same, that is, there is no difference, then we're going to be accepting the null hypothesis. That is, uh, presuming here that it's innocent. There is, this is not, the difference of this factor of a vended or internal site is not causing a difference between mean cost. However, if these are statistically different, then that's where we reject this null hypothesis. Again, which is like saying the same thing as we're accepting this alternative hypothesis where the mean cost of the vendor is not equal to the mean cost for internal locations. There is a difference statistically between them. Next, let's go to step three on defining the confidence and power levels. Now it's in this third step that we want to define the confidence and power levels. So what we're going to review are the two measurements of risk we've talked about in the past, which is the alpha and beta risk, and we're going to do a quick review of those. So as we did before, the explanation we'll use is like we're saying there's an empty glass that might represent all the possible knowledge or data evidence about a particular subject on something. 
And so we might say that the glass is filled with what data or evidence that we do have available to us. So we might ask ourselves how filled do we have to have this glass that is to get to some reasonable conclusion about it. Well we talked about the alpha risk as a threshold that we might say is about 95 percent here. The alpha risk itself is called a type 1 error also representing a false positive. The actual risk itself we might say is a default is about 5 percent. And then we say 1 minus that alpha risk the result is 95 percent that's what we call our confidence level and that's what we're defining here that's how high we want to have our level of data to measure our confidence so this type of risk the alpha risk from a judicial example um, perspective would say that's the risk of convicting an innocent person which is bad that's what we do not want to do so in that case we're saying that it's our lower threshold of reasonable doubt also from a statistical perspective we're saying that it's where a factor is causing a difference when really it's not. We don't want to say that it's causing a difference when it really isn't. We want to make sure that when we claim it's causing a difference that we're absolutely confident where we have at least 95 percent confidence to claim that it truly is making a difference. Because otherwise if we don't have that level of confidence from a practical perspective we may be fixing something that isn't broken in the first place. From the other beta risk perspective this is the threshold where we define that. That type of error is called a type 2 error representing a false negative. The default that we tend to use for beta risk is 10%. So the 1 minus the beta value which is 90% represents our power level that's defined here. Now in this example from a judicial example that we've had before we're saying it's like we're acquitting a guilty man. That is we're letting someone go free who is really guilty after all. By saying that what we're actually saying is this 90% that we have in our glass represents the upper threshold of reasonable trust. That's as high we're going to go for us to, to re reasonably trust whether someone is guilty or not. It's also like saying from a statistical perspective that we're saying a factor doesn't cause a difference when really it does cause a difference. Because if we're saying that it does not cause a difference, we're saying it's innocent, we're treating it as innocent when it's really guilty, then we might find ourselves from a practical standpoint diverting our attention away from the true root cause is. So what we said before is what we don't want to have is we don't want to have any any type of data or evidence that falls within this range of the 90 to 95 percent. It's okay for data or evidence does not reach 90 percent which is our power level or that upper threshold of reasonable trust. That's okay because that means when we say someone is innocent and we let them go free that is we we have enough data we don't have enough data to prove it's guilty and and we say this is a factor that is not the root cause then at least if we don't reach at least 90 percent level in here then we're saying that's okay. Uh, we, we, we can trust that we're not re reaching this level of, of beta risk. However, if we do have enough data to go above the 95 percent, and that should give us great confidence that when we're claiming it's guilty then we have enough data to back us up. We can be absolutely confident that it really is guilty just like we're claiming. But again when it falls in between this range of 90 and 95 percent that's similar to saying that you know what I've got enough data to say that I don't necessarily trust it but I don't have quite enough data to go above the 95 percent mark to really convict it and prove that I'm convicting someone who's guilty that is when I'm claiming it's a root cause when maybe it's not. So when it falls within this range, it's most dangerous, and that's where we have to go back and do some additional analysis. So what is the level of risk that we really need? Well, it's really going to depend on the inherent risks of what we're analyzing. So would we want a 5% risk as a default, like we're saying for the alpha risk here, if we're doing pharmaceutical testing or surgical equipment or, or doing nuclear engineering? Probably not. We probably would want something much lower in our level of risk. That is much smaller risk. By having smaller risk, then again, we're also saying we want much more confidence in our analysis results that we're, uh, of the data that we're analyzing. So most statistical tests that we run is going to require some confidence level. That is, it might ask for the alpha risk or it might ask for the confidence level, which is 1 minus the alpha. Most of them are not going to ask for the beta or the power level, but that's what we have to assess. So when we do our assessment, we're doing the analysis uh, based off of this and what we've defined here as our confidence level and power level, and what we look at the information, if the results are coming back unexpectedly, or again if they happen to be falling between this range,
range of 90 to 95 percent of our power level and confidence level or almost saying the same thing as we have a p-value a risk value somewhere between five and ten percent that's where it's really bad we want to minimize that risk as much as possible so we might have to go back collect more data collect more samples and do additional analysis on it so that way we can really be confident that we're claiming this really is the root cause and truly convicting it or we're claiming this is not the root cause and we're confident that it's not we can trust it and we're going to let it go free now we'll explore the fourth step on collecting the sample data. On this fourth step of collecting the sample data, you may recall that, in that we talked about in the measure phase of DMAIC how we reviewed the data collection plan or DCP in the measure phase. And we also talked about the sample size calculator in the measure phase. And also we talked about the measurement system analysis or MSA in the measure phase. So now when we've gone through those exercises with those tools, we should have confidence that we've got a data set that we can trust. It's reliable to us. And then it should include all the potential root causes, which we think are the factors or those suspects that we're analyzing that we're going to need to analyze through the rest of this hypothesis testing. So before we begin analysis right now, we need to make sure we're doing the following. That is, we need to determine what are the specific factors that we're going to be testing. So in our example that we had before, which is, is there a difference in cost between a vended and internally operated call center? We might ask, well, what are the factors in the data are necessary in order to test for that question? Well, we might think that we have to get at least data around cost, which might be our Y value. And then we have to also have information to determine the cost in association with what's vended or an internal call center. So by looking at that type of information, we need to go back to our data set to make sure it includes that in it. We also need to determine if the data contains sufficient samples for the analysis. If the data only contains a subset of the factors to be tested, then we need to rerun the sample size calculator to ensure that we have enough data samples for us to be confident we're going to get to the right conclusions on this test. So what if the collected data to use for the test doesn't meet the required sample size? Well, we need to figure what are the risks. That might be okay, and depending on the difficulty of actually collecting data and collecting that sample again, so are we willing to accept the risks that might be there? Or is there another way that we can mitigate those risks if possible? Now the next step is calculating the p-value. So first let's ask what is the p-value? From a technical standpoint, it's the probability of getting a sample statistic like the one that's observed if the null hypothesis is true. Well, from a practical standpoint, it represents the percent of chance or wrong or risk of being wrong when concluding a difference between the factors. That is, if a p-value comes back at 0.03, which is 3%, it's, um, it's basically saying there's a 3% chance that or 3% level of risk that I could be wrong when I conclude a difference between the factors that I'm analyzing. Or what you could also do is you can calculate 1 minus the p-value, and that represents the percent chance of being right that there is a difference in the tested factors. So how do we calculate this p-value? Well, most of the statistical tests that we're going to be looking at, especially with the mini tab, will automatically calculate that p-value for us. So we're going to see that in, some, in all the different tests that we'll be showing in this analyze phase. So it shouldn't be difficult for us to calculate. We don't have to worry about it. The test will give us that result automatically. And now let's dive into the last of the sub-processes on interpreting the results. Well, in this last step for interpretation, we're going to accept or reject the null hypothesis. So this is where we're going to compare the p-value with the alpha risk that we had defined. So if the p-value is greater than the alpha risk, then we're going to accept the null hypothesis. That is, if the p-value is greater than, for example, 0.05, which is 5% as a default alpha risk, then there is no difference between the results of what we're analyzing. However, if the p-value is less than the alpha risk, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Again, it's the same thing as saying if the p-value is less than 0.05, then there is a difference, a statistical difference between the items that we're evaluating. So what does this mean as a statistical solution? If we're accepting the null hypothesis, that validates that there is no statistical difference between the tested factors. Or more appropriately, we might say there is insufficient data to prove that there is a statistical difference between the factors. Sometimes it's nicer to say that because you may not have a big sample size and without having a big sample size your data may be just insufficient in the amount of data to, to be able to prove a difference. But if you were to collect more data it might prove there really is a difference after all. So sometimes it's better to say there isn't enough data to sufficiently prove a statistical difference between the tested factors.
But if we're rejecting the null hypothesis, then that's validating that there is a statistical difference between the tested factors. Or you might say there is sufficient data to prove that there is a statistical difference between the factors that were being tested. Now, how are we going to interpret this information into a practical solution? Well, let's go back to our example. If the original question was, is there a difference in cost between a vended and internally operated call center, then we might say if the p-value is less than the alpha risk, then we conclude there is a statistically significant difference in the average cost between the vended and internally operated call center. Or we basically say, yes, there is a difference, is a simple way of saying it. But we also have to consider that there could be some other practical implications. So we can't just automatically accept that. Let's just make sure we're, we're properly balancing it with the information that we're evaluating. For example, what if the cost difference between them was just a dollar a call? Well, is a dollar significant or not? Or what if the cost difference was only five cents per call? Yes, we can prove a difference, maybe statistically, between them, but is it meaningful at all? Is five cents or even a dollar as a difference, is that meaningful? Or what if your alpha risk was 5% but your p-value came back at 0.08? Again, some folks might say, well, because my p-value of 8% is greater than my alpha risk, then I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. Um, I'm sorry, then I'm going to accept the null hypothesis and I'll assume that there is no difference between them. But we shouldn't do that. This is where it falls within that gray area uh, where it's, it's still we have to consider that beta risk because it falls within the 5%, 10% thresholds of the alpha and beta risks. Then we're saying there's not enough data to prove conclusively with at least statistically that there is a difference between them. However, there is enough data to say it might be guilty after all, so maybe we shouldn't let it go free. So because it falls within that 5 to 10% range that we might have defined as our alpha and beta risks, then that should tell us we need to go back, collect more data, rerun the analysis, just to be confident that we're not letting it go free when we shouldn't have or we're not convicting it when we shouldn't have. All right, before we close this lesson, let's discuss how we can apply some of these concepts in a practical way. Well, in anticipation of doing a whole lot of review of the future statistical tests we'll be analyzing within the analyze phase, what I'd like you to do is prepare for that as best as possible so that way we can run the test on the same set of data. So what I'd like you to do is try to identify at least one critical metric that you use within your organization and then try to do these following steps. We'll use that metric as our output Y, our primary metric, for most of these future lessons, again, that we're going to be doing on hypothesis testing. That output Y should be continuous value or numeric value. Now, if you only have something that's a percentage, which, again, typically would be a, a proportional measurement based off of a discrete value, then that's okay. Let's get something at least we can represent as some numeric value. Then identify at least five other factors related to the output Y metric. And we'll use these to serve as our X's, the input X's that we'll be analyzing. These other factors should include at least two continuous or at least two discrete types of values. In other words, don't let them all be discrete and don't let them all be continuous. Make sure you have at least a mixture in there to, to allow us for additional uh, opportunities for analyzing the data based off of the statistical test we'll look at. And then label each of those factors, each of those five as X1, X2, and X3. And again, we're going to prepare this. Now, some examples of other factors could be if you have a cost metric, then you might have a factor be based off of different types of products that you have or different types of services that you have and how you might define those. Or maybe uh, a factor one of the other X factors could be something that's the uh, different stores or locations, ge geographic locations, or, or different other business lines, uh, lines of business that you might have in your organization. Whatever it is, let those factors um, be something that, that helps uniquely identify uh, and be related to that primary output Y that we're looking at. Then what you do is go back and get the data for that Y and all those X's for a reasonable time frame at a reasonable level of detail. So the data should, you should have enough data to have at least 30 to 50 different observations. It's okay if you have a whole lot more, that's fine, but try to get at least 30 to 50 if possible. The more granular that you get your data, then the more observations that you should have collected. For example, if you're using daily values, then there should be probably several months worth of values that you can get. Just over several months, you might be able to easily get 200 or more observations. But if you're doing a data collection off of something that's a monthly value, then you probably have to go back several years worth because even three years will have 36 monthly observations. So that may not be possible to get that. So you might want to get a little bit more granular that will give you the opportunity to get more data points for your example.
Now, if you're using sample data, then ensure that the data that you're, you're using is randomly collected and ensure that you can trust the reliability of that collected data. For example, you might need to run a, an MSA, a measurement system analysis, on it in order to make sure you can trust the data. Now, keep all those factors on hand. Once you've got all the information, keep it on hand so that way we can use those as practical applications in the future lessons where we're going to be looking at hypothesis testing according to all the different statistical tests we'll be looking throughout the analyze phase. Well, that wraps up this lesson. Check out statstuff.com for many more resources that can help you achieve powerful results. I'm Matt Hansen. Thanks for watching.